What is your name? Thank you, Transition Fidalgo and friends, for having me here tonight. How many people are here for the first time? Please raise your hand. Okay, so maybe a, between a third, a little over a third. And so how many people have been coming to every one of these for the last five years? <laughs> Quite a few people. Okay. So my question to you is, why are you here tonight? Please raise your hand if any of the following statements resonate with you. I want to protect my family. I want to be ready for the big one. I want to be prepared to help my neighbors in the disaster. And I want to face disasters with courage. So those are some pretty powerful intentions. And what we're going to do in the next 45 minutes is translate those intentions into a personal family preparedness plan. It's what you should have picked up when you walked in. This two-page worksheet is going to show you, by the time we're done tonight, exactly what you need to do to get prepared. And it's going to do more than that. It's going to be an expression of your intention to get ready, to get prepared, and to get strong. We're going to do it together. But wouldn't it be great to have something beyond just being prepared to motivate you? What if I told you that there was a way by the time you were done tonight, to get a chance to win one of these outstanding flashlights, radios, and cell phone chargers. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. Well, I'm gonna tell you how to do that in just a bit. Now, everything we're gonna cover tonight is, in, uh, is on the City of Anacortes' website. Um, and um, uh, you can find it on their emergency uh, disaster preparedness uh, page. Uh, because, as um, Eric noted, this effort is in cooperation with the city of Anacortes. To start, each of you needs to decide what on who is getting you motivated to be better prepared for a disaster. Simply getting ready is hard to do. It's hard to do the right thing. It's like writing your will. No one really wants to do it. But getting prepared for a disaster is something that you do need to do. So what's going to motivate you? What positive thing is going to motivate you? For most of us, it's someone we love. So put another way, when the ground stops shaking, when you hear that a winter storm is coming that's going to knock out power for a week, who are you going to be thinking about? This is your time to start working on your plan. Step one in your plan is to make a commitment to the people you care about. So please take a moment to think about this because whether you're getting prepared for your own household or someone who's nearby, you need to think about who that person is. So please think about who that person is, jot their name down, um, and then sign it. Well, let's do it. Let's turn uh, that intention you expressed earlier um, and your desire to help a loved one into a reality. We have three goals tonight. Our first goal is to give you perspective on disasters because they are survivable. Otherwise, I wouldn't be up here talking to you. Secondly, we're going to challenge you to prepare because the best intentions and even um, your plan as written isn't enough. You're going to need to follow through on these intentions to know the risk, make a plan, and prepare a kit. And then lastly, we're going to connect you to others because Connections with others is a big part of sustainability and it's a big part of disaster preparedness and survival. Do these seem like good goals to spend the next 37 minutes on? What do you think? Raise your hands if you think. Okay, very good. We're in this together, so let's push on. And something we don't do enough in 2019 America, and I think many people with transition, Fidalgo and friends would agree with me, is we don't spend enough time talking to one another. So we're gonna rectify that right now. What I'd like you to do, if you haven't guessed by now, these tables are set up to facilitate this, is we're going to ask you to, to pair up in, in families or, or households, um, doesn't matter how many people. Um, if you wind up with three at your table and, or three households, that's okay. Uh, but we're gonna try and do as much of tonight in, in pairs of households, and you'll see why by the time we're done. And while you do this, you're going to, uh, you're going to do three things in, in the next three, four minutes. You're going to introduce yourself. You're going to say what neighborhood you live in, since that seems to be an easy uh, icebreaker. And then you're going to share why you intend to take the important step of emergency preparedness. Personally, what's, what's really bringing you here tonight? Is it fear? Is it hope? Share that. Does everyone understand this? OK. 
Okay, so let's take the next couple minutes to do this, please. Let's now turn to disasters, shall we? Um, there are so many, aren't there? Um, I mean, all you have to do is turn on the TV, right? And, and the world's going to heck in a handbasket. There are so many things going wrong, and uh, you should stay at home and uh, you know, sit on the couch uh, in your uh, cozy uh, robe and, and just never leave. Um, but and it and you know why it's bad? It's because when natural disasters strike people panic, right? They run in the streets, they behave badly, um, and um, we, we know that, right? Because we, we see that on TV, we see that in Hollywood movies. Well, actually, it's, it's not true. Um, in fact, one of the most important things I want to leave you with tonight is a sense of perspective, um, that disasters are survivable um, in large part because people come together in disasters. They actually don't panic. There's a lot of uh, good uh, history uh, and psychology that shows in disasters, um, people actually far from panicking um, often freeze and they, they don't act. And what we want to do is we want to act in a positive way. So disasters are survivable. Um, disasters are equal opportunity. Everyone's affected by them, but so is preparation. Everyone can survive. In fact, everyone in this room, if you're committed to it, can be better prepared um, a month from now than you are right now. And we're going to do it together. There are so many disasters. There are natural disasters and there are human caused disasters. Um, and uh, the list of them is so long. Um, I don't need to read through it. You're well aware of what they are. Um, the list can seem intimidating. It can paralyze you into doing nothing. But the length of the list is, uh, hides a crucial factor that you can actually take some fairly simple steps to prepare for nearly all of these disasters. Preparedness always begins with a healthy and realistic mindset. Um, you can survive, um, and your actions do make a difference. And what's more is you can be a model for other people. And simply being prepared puts you 30 seconds ahead of everyone else, and that will make a tremendous difference in a disaster. We sometimes talk about a preparedness pyramid, and um, preparedness is logical, and it has a series of steps that build on one another. Um, disaster preparedness begins with personal preparedness. Like with so many things in life, your uh, personal mindset and commitment to action is the basis for progress. Once you've made the emotional, psychological, and perhaps even spiritual commitment that you will survive, then you can take the steps that flow from that. And once you take those steps as a person, as an individual, then you can turn to your family's preparedness. And much of what we're going to focus on is family preparedness tonight, uh, because that's that crucial link between the fact all of you are here, you've shown a personal uh, commitment to this. We're going to talk about family preparedness as this uh, key second layer of the preparedness pyramid. Now, we'll also spend a little bit of time talking about neighborhood preparedness and community preparedness, um, just so you have a sense of where you can go with this once you've taken your family to the level they need to be at. Something else about this pyramid uh, is very important to understand. It's logical and systematic. So you need to start with personal preparedness before you can move on to family preparedness. And until you're prepared, um, you've prepared your family, you aren't going to be able to help your immediate neighborhood. And if you haven't helped, until you've helped your immediate neighborhood, you won't be able to help the community at large. So um, this also helps keep people from feeling overwhelmed because you take this one step at a time each layer builds the foundation for the next level. Now, um, what's missing from this pyramid about government? It's not because government isn't important. In fact, government is crucial. Um, here in Anacortes, um, the city government has made emergency preparedness one of its six priorities, which is an expression of uh, great leadership in my view. But natural disasters, by definition, overwhelm the normal resources of government. <coughs> So we're going to be on our own for days, weeks, and perhaps even longer for certain disasters. And the more that we can take care of ourselves, our families, and our neighborhood, um, the less strain and demand we place on the governments that serve us. 
So why prepare now? You, we're all busy people. We all have lots of important things. Why prepare now? Well, by definition, disasters can strike without warning. The uh, Cascadian earthquake could, could happen tomorrow. It could happen in 70 years. We simply don't know. We're taking a gamble uh, if we don't prepare. And if we do, we're going to win one way or the other. By definition, disasters mean that emergency personnel will be overwhelmed and you are going to be on your own for days, if not weeks. But there's also a psychological component. You'll simply be more comfortable. The next time you hear about a wildfire that causes people to, to flee their home or an earthquake, you won't have to think, oh, I should, I should take care of that. Or you don't want to have a sleepless night. You're going to feel better because you're going to be prepared and your family is going to be prepared. Everyone in your family will know what to do if you do emergency preparedness well at the family level. You also be, might be separated from your loved ones. And the last thing you want to have to do in, in an emergency is worry about whether they know what to do and have the resources to take care of themselves until you can be reunited. And lastly, as I mentioned, in disasters, people want to help their, their, their friends and neighbors. But if you haven't taken care of your family, it's going to be very hard to be effective in helping others. So with a healthy mindset, now we're turning to goal two. This is going to be the heart of our time together tonight. We're going to prepare, and we're going to do it with three specific tasks. We're going to talk about the risk, we're going to make a plan, and we're going to get you started on preparing a kit. To prepare for a natural disaster, you have to know what risk you're preparing for. And risks are dependent on a region, and they're dependent on you and your family situation. The consequences of disasters can be similar, and a lot of the preparation you do will be uh, the same regardless of the disaster, but there can be some crucial differences. Um, what you ultimately need to do is figure out what risk your family is most exposed to. And even though we're all mostly anacortisans here, I presume, um, each family may experience the risk in a different way for a given disaster. So knowing the risk is important. And these three risks are used by the city in their own planning, and I think they're an excellent guide for, for family preparedness. So they include earthquake. As Eric mentioned, this is, this is the big one we all talk about. It's something which pretty much everyone should be aware of, that we're at risk for um, earthquakes here in Puget Sound and Cascadia. And it gets better than that because we have three distinct types of earthquakes we get to plan for. Um, regardless of the one you're, you're concerned about, it all involves shaking ground. Um, then high winds is a, another one which happens quite frequently and it can knock out power uh, for a great deal of time as well as blocking um, transportation corridors. And then lastly, winter storms can have a similar effect um, combined with the, the, the loss of electricity, um, which can um, leave people without heat for long periods of time. Uh, I came from Seattle and um, there was a time a few years ago where there's a winter storm when there were neighborhoods which did not have power for, for nearly three weeks. Um, and that was in a very urban area, so it can happen. Um, so the bottom line is these are good risks to think around, to, to think about. And why do they matter? They matter because there are hazards associated with these disasters. Um, they inc include very basic hazards, such as people being injured. Um, and uh, a consequence of earthquake is very often is fire. Then you have the other... Um, Aspects of civilization that we take for granted every single day until they aren't there. Water, power, uh, sanitation. So it's your turn again. So we talked in step one about what's the, what's the good thing motivating you? What, someone you love. Now we need to talk about what your disaster is that you're preparing for. This is a great country. You get to choose your own disaster here. Um, so um, we live in a small community on an island. And again, I think Transition Fidalgo and Friends is um, in the forefront of trying to remind people that we depend on resources drawn from a very far away. Um, and so we want each family to think about which disaster is the one which will help guide your planning. What, what's the disaster that will crystallize in your minds uh, your answers to the decisions you're going to need to make? So um, what we're going to ask here is for you to take a minute as a family to think about which of these resonate with you. Which of these are ones that you want to build your disaster plan around? And it's perfectly acceptable if there are others to add. Um, uh, Eric's mentioned about wildfire was something which also came up in one of our previous discussions. It, it, uh, and if that matters to you, you should absolutely put it down. So take a moment, um, if, you, if these all resonate with you, put a check by all of them. If only one resonates, uh, check that. Um, and then, uh, so take 30 seconds to do that, please, as a family. So hold up your
five-year plan. It looks like we're about 90%. Okay, thank you. You can put, your, you can put those plans down. Um, did, uh, is there anyone who wants to share, uh, was there a disaster that they jotted down that uh, motivates them? That wasn't on the list? Yeah. Flooding? Flooding? Absolutely. Flooding can have a big impact um, uh, on us here on the island, uh, depending on where you live in terms of local, but more generally, our water supply is based on um, our um, uh, water treatment plant on the Skagit River, and at a certain flood level, the city actually has to shut it down, um, so we would be without water. So. Did anybody list the zombie apocalypse? I just want to make sure. Okay, okay. There's always, there's always one person, so you need to add baseball bat to your kid, okay? So by now, your, your, um, your family plan should be looking something like this. Hopefully it doesn't look exactly like this because then we'll have to talk with you afterwards. But um, you should be filling this out. This is, a, this is very much an interactive exercise and you, you get out of this what you put into it, okay? So um, we're talking about making a plan. Um, and uh, you have to have a plan to be prepared. Um, what you are preparing right now, you're going to photocopy when you're done. So I hope you're writing nice and clearly because you're going to want to save a few copies of this. Maybe put one in the glove box of the car, um, possibly have it at work because there's going to be some important information on it. Um, but you're going to want to keep copies of this in a couple of areas. And if you choose to make a more expansive plan down the road, again, you're going to want to have paper copies. In a disaster, we go from being a digital world to an analog world. So you're going to, you're going to really appreciate paper and that iPad's going to um, not be very useful in about three hours. So your plan um, is going to include some important answers to some important questions like where will you meet, how will you connect, and how can you stay self-sufficient? Now these might seem like big questions, um, and um, guess what? You actually are going to be answering some of them right now tonight with your plan. Keep coming back to this plan. So um, moving on to the second step in um, our uh, middle goal here is um, you're going to be preparing a kit. Now how many of you think about preparing a kit as that's what you do to be emergency prepared, disaster preparedness? You have to prepare a kit. Yeah. And that's great because you get to go shopping, right? Yeah. So um, preparing a kit is important. Um, it, it is a very important part, but again, it follows the, the more important parts of uh, being uh, emotionally prepared and uh, committed to um, survival. Um, the kit, um, here are some guidelines for thinking about a kit. It needs to start with the, the thought of 72 hours or three days. Um, this, is, this is your bare bones kit. Um, what are you going to need to basically um, keep your, you and your family uh, healthy? Um, and, uh, and alive uh, for three, three days. Now, prepackaged kits can get you started. They're an easy way to get off the dime, um, but you're gonna want to expand them, uh, both to tailor to meet your own family's needs, but also to simply uh, uh, last quite a bit longer. And you're gonna be creating mini kits um, for uh, your car and, and possibly your place of work. Now, uh, creating a kit, uh, there are lots of great resources and you are going to walk away with one or two outstanding resources tonight. I haven't given them to you yet, but they're on the table, so when you leave tonight, you're going to uh, get a chance to choose them. Um, these, uh, there are uh, checklists that are available from the federal government, uh, from the state government, and um, from our own uh, City of Anacortes uh, uh, government. Um, I happen to think the city's um, checklist is among the best, and so that's the one we're going to be, uh, you're, you're going to have a chance to take that away um, tonight. Uh, there are also checklists that are available for particular family situations, such as if, if you have pets or, or um, uh, uh, special needs uh, for family members. Now, these are sort of laundry style lists. There are some lists that are also based on calendars. So if you're the kind of person who just wants to do it systematically over time, there are some great resources that will allow you to do it on a weekly basis or on a monthly basis. Now, all these things I'm showing you are actually, um, you're going to walk away with the links to the resources. So this resource, the, the, blue, uh, the blue heading sheet, has all the resources I'm gonna to cover tonight. And the reason we did it this way is people get overwhelmed by the sheer amount of stuff out there, and there's a lot of great stuff. We're trying to keep it simple. We're trying to keep the amount of resources from being an obstacle for you to do what you need to do. So um, 
uh, two of these items um, are the ones that I'm going to uh, promote by uh, uh, giving you a chance to walk away with the city's 72-hour um, uh, kit and then um, prepare in six months, one week at a time. I happen to think those are two great alternatives. You can take one or both. So um, I'm gonna go through a couple of slides that show what are the types of things that are gonna be on your list. Uh, I noticed some of you are keeping notes. Don't feel you need to write this down. The checklist you walk away with will be much better than um, the summary version on the slides. But um, I wanna point out that all the kits start with a sort of, uh, sort of uh, beans and water uh, sort of thing, uh, uh, things that you need to have. Um, these are the sort of the obvious low hanging fruit items. Um, about the only thing to add to this is some of these are consumable and expire, so you'll want to uh, check your kits periodically to rotate out items that can be used or that have expired. And um, some are, so then there are items like radios and flashlights. And you know, this brings me back to something I wanted to share with you that there really is great radio flashlight cell phone charger, which, and why do we emphasize this importance of a radio? Well, because in a natural disaster, again, we're going back to an analog world. Um, believe it or not, there were radios in the analog world, but um, we are not going to have cell service for long uh, because the <coughs> generators that power the cell phone towers will eventually run out of uh, diesel. Um, and then uh, the, the, even the best fiber network um, created by our city uh, isn't going to withstand a, a major earthquake. Um, kits also need uh, specialty items and a number of other things um, that uh, are, depending on your family situation, may be critical, such as medications, particularly medications that require refrigeration. Um, and then beyond the physical, there are some uh, emotional uh, items that you should think about um, that may be particularly important if you must leave your house. There's also a lot of paper that's important, again, analog world. Um, so having cash on hand, having important documents that you can walk away with will be critical. Now, uh, complementing the kit are uh, several other steps that you need to do. They're visible at the bottom of, of your plan page. So these include conducting a home hazard hunt. Now, again, there's a link to this particular poster, which I think is very good, on your resource list, so you can do this. How many people have done a home hazard hunt? Please raise your hand. Earthquake. Of course, Jay has. Yes, I, I expect that. <laughs> um, Jay's one of my colleagues in, in the CERT community. Um, so this is something, let's just say you all have the opportunity to shine in this regard um, because your home uh, actually has a number of hazards um, that will be um, activated when the ground starts shaking. And then um, you also need to know how to turn off your utilities um, and when to turn off your utilities. Certain disasters require you to turn off your utilities in the interest of safety and others um, will be very dependent on the circumstances. So knowing when to, um, when and how to turn off these utilities is something you can do through the community emergency response teams, as well as through Map Your Neighborhood program, which I'll talk about a little later. There are also plenty of YouTube resources on these things, um, but uh, you need to know where your water uh, shutoff valve is. Everyone in the household needs to know this, and you need to know when to turn, or why to turn it off. Um, similarly with gas, there are three indicators of why you should turn gas off. Um, uh, they are if you see it, if you hear it, or if you see the dial spinning. Um, I'm not going to say anything more about that because that's something you really need to know about and, and, and uh, take a look at um, in your own uh, family situation and then similarly with uh, electricity. So this brings us back to your work. You need to do some more work, folks. Uh, step three of your plan. Um, you have a, a fair bit uh, to fill out in step three. Um, you're going to be doing this as a family. Um, and you're going to be spending a few minutes thinking about how you're going to connect. And then you're going to be um, checking uh, the bottom three items because by checking it, you're making commitments to do those steps, to prepare your kits, to conduct your home hazard hunt, and then to uh, learn how and when to turn off utilities. So we're gonna take a couple minutes. Uh, most families need to think a little bit about how, who their out-of-state contact is gonna be and where you're going to meet if you can't get home. Um, just one more uh, point on this, where you'll meet when you cannot get home. This is where the disaster you are preparing for matters. If you're thinking about a winter, a winter storm or windstorm, that's really not an issue. But, so in this case, it's probably earthquake. So think about um, you know, what happens if there's an earthquake. Where are you going to meet? So this is subject to revision.
So at this point, your plan should be looking something like this. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, out-of-state contact is so important is because um, it's, uh, at least in recent disasters in North America, um, local communications get overwhelmed because everyone's trying to call everyone else, but it's often easier to reach out of state, uh, particularly if you're using text as opposed to um, other forms of telecommunication. So it's still your turn. We're going to move on to step four. So step four is where you're going to focus on a realistic and yet motivating time frame for getting your kits done. And what could be more motivating than Thanksgiving? So um, it's still your choice, but think about a time uh, frame here in the order of weeks in which you will get your plan put together and um, make that commitment by putting that date down there. Okay, so hold up your plan if you've completed step four, please. About halfway there, 75% there. Everyone has a date. They've made a commitment to get their, their kids together. Okay, thank you. So your, your plan should be looking like this. Uh, so if you're keeping track, we're 80% done, so good job. So to recap, in goal number two, we had three tasks. They included knowing the risks, knowing our region. You know our region, and you've identified the risks that are important to you and your family. You have committed to making a plan. You're actually doing it right now. This is your starter plan that you're working on. And then you've committed to preparing kits. That you have to do on your own, some assembly required. Um, but uh, you now uh, have made a pact with yourself about when you're going to do that. So um, these tasks are not hard. They are not time consuming. We estimate they'll take between eight to 10 hours. So depending on your um, uh, alternative activities, that's, that's two Seahawks games with post show. That's, that's not even a season of Downton Abbey uh, there, folks. I mean, <laughs> isn't this more important than those things? Don't you think your family's safety, health, and well-being, and your peace of mind? So let's turn to goal three. Let's come back to what we started with, connecting. Our third goal focuses on people who are important to us beyond our family, our neighbors, other members in the Anacortes community. Again, what we see time and again in um, most disasters is that people come together. The TV news likes to show those rare instances where people fight and squabble, but usually people are helping one another. So because people want to help each other, they need to be prepared. They need to plan to help each other as well as to plan for their family. And that brings us to neighborhood preparedness and community preparedness. I'm going to cover this fairly briefly, but um, for those of you who are motivated to take family preparedness beyond, I want to share a little bit about what to do so you can safely help people outside your family. There are two resources um, that have been developed nationally um, and uh, are widely employed here in Anacortes, including Map Your Neighborhood, uh, to help with the neighborhood and community emergency response teams or CERTs, which are intended to help at the broader community level. So what is Map Your Neighborhood? Um, it builds disaster preparedness at really from your neighborhood. So stepping outside your home, if you live in a single family home, that's, that block is your neighborhood. Um, and it takes a nine step program that starts with the household and it kind of transitions from household preparedness out to responding as a neighborhood um, in the event of a major disaster. Um, and it creates a contact list of neighbors as well as a list of resources that you have in the form of skills and things that you as a neighborhood will be able to draw upon. And until you've done this, you will have no idea how many long ladders or fire extinguishers or generators are in your, in your neighborhood, but there are a lot, I can tell you. Um, and um, one of the, what it uh, does is it uh, 
consists of creating a map of your neighborhood. This is a map that I did for the neighborhood right next to mine. I've done map your neighborhood for my block and for two blocks around my uh, block um, to create a sort of um, web um, or greater neighborhood of preparedness. And each of these numbers corresponds to contact information that's created um, at the Map Your Neighborhood program. It's a two hour program um, that um, uh, comes with a set of invitations and a brochure that um, then everyone walks away with. And the Map Your Neighborhood brochure neatly complements this family preparedness plan um, that we have prepared tonight. And I have um, examples of this, which um, I'll be happy to share with anyone who wants to come up afterwards so you can see what Map Your Neighborhood is all about. And, and lastly, one great thing about Map Your Neighborhood is if you're a really nosy person who wants to know everything about that new family who moved in down the block, do Map Your Neighborhood because you'll find out everything you wanted to know. It's amazing. <laughs> So um, complementing Map Your Neighborhood is a community emergency response team. So um, the disaster struck, your family is safe, um, you've contacted your out-of-state contact, you've done Map Your Neighborhood, and everyone in your neighborhood's um, uh, great, and so you want to go out and help the greater Anacortes or Fidalgo Island community, so you need to be a CERT to do that. Um, and so um, CERTs are um, trained volunteers who learn to do basic things like putting out fires and doing light search and rescue. Um, they learn how to work safely in groups to get things done. Um, they learn how to work with the, the government first responders um, uh, to complement um, the activities of the city through doing um, uh, community assessments. And um, we have trainings um, that are done usually twice a year um, oh, excuse me, and uh, we're always motivated by the greatest good for the greatest number. And if you do the, the six-week program, <laughs> then you earn a backpack and you earn a hard hat. <laughs> and um, it's, a, it's a pretty great thing, um, but you're expected to turn out and help when the uh, disaster strikes. To, uh, to get into the CERT program, uh, you need to take the class. Um, and um, Rick Wallace is an exceptional volunteer here in Anacortes who has taught this for many years. And um, so his contact information is here. It's also, again, on the, uh, the presentation, which is available at the city website. So if six months from now you want to do this, you can track him down and, and uh, do it. I did it four years ago. And as you can see, I kind of got hooked on disaster, I guess you'd say. Um, so um, that's a bit of context here. Um, so let's come back to that connection you made early on. So I know that you are all people of integrity. And I know that this plan you've completed, you're going to do, right? Because you're people of integrity. But isn't it just possible, oops, isn't it just possible it might help if you knew there was someone out there to support you, someone who had your back on this. And we might call that person your, your disaster buddy. And who might this person be? Well, you met them already. You met them earlier tonight. They're at your table. That's your disaster buddy. So step five is actually really important here. So we know that People like Jay and I can go out and talk about disaster preparedness, you know, tell our, you know, we turn blue in the face. And people think that is a darn good idea. My neighbor should do that. <laughs> well, you guys need to do it. And um, we're going to, this, this program has a little bit of a twist. We're kind of doing it together. Okay? So what we're encouraging everyone to do is to um, turn again to your disaster buddy in just a few minutes and um, commit to between now and Thanksgiving to reach out at least once. And if you're really shy, you can do it by email or text. Or if you're really gregarious, you can have them over for dinner. I don't really care how, but the idea is that you will do something to reach out to your disaster buddy to say, did you do it? Or celebrate success, whatever it takes. We don't want to be painful, but we want you to do this together. Secondly, if this is worthwhile for you and your family, and you said it is, we've already spent almost 40 minutes doing it together, isn't it important for your neighbor, your favorite neighbor? So we're also gonna ask you um, between now and Thanksgiving to reach out to 
your uh, favorite neighbor and tell them about what you're doing and saying, this is a pretty good idea. Just spread the power of your uh, modeling, okay? So it's now your turn to do step five. And the best way to do step five is to share swap sheets because you want your disaster buddy to write their name and contact information really clearly because they want the radio. I mean, because they want your support. Okay, so we are just about wrapping up our time together. Let's summarize what we have done here together. First, we have given you perspective. Disasters are survivable with planning, with preparation, with the proper mental mindset. Um, we've challenged you to prepare. The core of our time together was putting together a plan that's based on the risks that are local to our area and then preparing kits that meet the needs of our family. And then third, we've done some connection here. We've connected you, and there's the uh, prospect of more connection here, uh, again, just in case someone wants to win a radio. Um, but uh, most importantly, we want, to, we want to provide an incentive for people to follow through on this. This is one of those things which we all know we need to do. Knowing that someone's going to reach out to you sometime between now and Thanksgiving might be a little bit of an incentive that gets us all to follow through. You're going to leave with three pieces of paper, possibly four. Um, it's, you're going to leave with your family preparedness plan. So you have completed the core of your family preparedness plan. Then you've got your resource list. Look, look how the flashlight works. It really does work. And then you are going, uh, lastly, to have your kit checklist. And we're going to have that at the back. Eric's got that at the back. So there are two checklists. There's the 72-hour kit checklist from the city of Anacortes, and then there's the six-month weekly calendar. I encourage you to select and commit to one. If you're the kind of person who needs to keep their options open, you can take both. There's plenty to go around. Or pick one, and you can download the other uh, down the, um, from the city's website. The point here is we want to remove every single obstacle we can to you getting prepared. We want all the decision making to be done here tonight and then after that it's just going with the plan. So our time together was focused on getting ready, on getting connected and getting strong. And by doing this together, you have committed to protecting your families, to being ready for the big one, to being ready to help your neighbors in a disaster, and to facing disasters with courage. This is your plan. Go forth, complete it, be prepared. We will do this together. Yes, we will. Thank you very much.